Yeah. And please mic uh, mute, mute your microphones. And at the end, there'll be an opportunity for questions. And just make sure you turn on your mic then. Okay. Go ahead, Trish. We're recording. Okay. Welcome, everybody. This is, I think, the last lecture in this spring series of the Irish Institute for Catholic Studies program. And today, the last lecture is uh, a lecture featuring What About the Nuns, delivered by Dr. Avine Mullally, and who comes from Marino Institute of Education in Dublin, and myself, Trish Kieran from Mary Immaculate College. So we're presenting ongoing and emerging research, and this is our maiden voyage, our first out outing with the research. So we're really interested to hear in your thoughts and your ideas. So can you take it away, Avine? And we'll start with our presentation. So Avine is going to share the screen. I can... Can everybody see this, the slides? Just put a thumbs up if you can, yeah. Can everyone see the slides? Okay. So if I begin, this research is an exploratory collaborative research involving two university colleges in the Republic of Ireland, one in Dublin, the capital, and one in Limerick, the real capital in the south of Ireland. Mm -hmm. And this is just the initial phase of the research, phase one. We hope to have two subsequent phases. And we've carried out this initial piece of research focusing on our postgraduate master's in education. It's a two year course, a PME course, qualifying students to become primary school teachers. And we have focused in particular on their understandings of and attitudes towards non-religious beliefs in primary or elementary schools in the Republic of Ireland. And our total data set was 240 of these third level adult, full-time postgraduate students in education in Mary Immaculate College and Marino Institute of Education. And we had a response rate of about 40%, just over 40%, which we were happy with given that we carried out the research under COVID-19 restrictions. And so we had to do a lot of it online. So this PME stakeholder group, why were we focusing on the postgraduate masters in education students? Well, we selected them because of the professional orientation of their degrees and also because we felt they had rich life experience and they had a capacity for critical reflection that would be invaluable when we were looking at the whole area of non-religious beliefs in schools in Ireland today. So if you can move on to the next slide, Avine. So uh, how did we design our research? Well, we started off with anonymous online confidential voluntary survey using a secure survey package. And we thought SurveyMonkey was a very good package to use. We designed a questionnaire and we had 28 questions in it. And we're very conscious of survey fatigue. And we tried to keep it as brief, but we wanted to get rich data. So we thought a 10 minute survey to complete. And there were four sections in it. And we started off identifying who was this cohort, so about you, so that we would have some context for the findings when it came to the students. We wanted to profile the students' beliefs and to look at their religious and non-religious beliefs. Then we wanted their perspectives on non-religious in primary schools in the Republic of Ireland. And then we wanted to ask them about professional practice. What were their thoughts on their own future professional practice and how they might engage with non-religious parents, teachers, pupils, members of society. We had to get ethical clearance and institutional approval and that's quite difficult for an area like this because it's a sensitive complex area but we got ethical clearance and we also engaged for a qualitative aspect of this research in in-depth interviews and we did that through Zoom and we're all learning um, so we did it with six students and they were self-selecting and again it was voluntary anonymous. Can you move on please Avine? So why are we doing this research? Well you just have to look at the rationale for this 
when you look at the census data for the Republic of Ireland. And prior to 2002, there was no specific category in Ireland in the census that said no religion. People prior to 2002 just wrote in what is your religion? And they wrote into a box, no religion. And they wrote in, you can see in 1991, agnostic, atheist, no religion. In 2002 was the first time that no religion got recognition in the census box. And you can see the rapid increase in numbers of people self-identifying as having no religion. Between 2011 and 2016, in that five years alone, we had an increase of 73% in the number of people self-identifying as being non-religious. So that now in the Republic of Ireland, this is the fastest growing category in the census. And one in 10 people in the Republic of Ireland, 9.8% to be specific, say that they have no religion. So we're interested in this whole group. Can you move on please, Aileen? So we're not alone in this. For instance, in Europe, Stephen Bullivant's report in 2019, and he has engaged in a, a worldwide study with other academics on this area. And he's been working in this area for the last 10 years. He really is at the cutting edge of this. Um, and he said the proportion of young adults, so he's looking specifically here at the data on young adults, 16 to 29, with no religious affiliation, is as high as 91% in the Czech Republic, 80% in Estonia, 75% in Sweden. And it compares to only 1% in Israel, 17% in Poland, and 25% in Lithuania. In the UK and France, the proportions for the young 16 to 29 year old nuns are 70% in the UK and 64% in France, respectively. Now, when it comes to the UK, 25% of the total population is non religious. And Linda Woodhead says that. The non-religious is the new cultural majority in the UK. So as researchers, we think that it's really important to research this area. And we wanted to find out what's happening in Ireland. What are we doing about this area? How are we educating people about this area? And how do an educated cohort like PME students feel about the area? Can we move on, please, Aiding? Just before we dip into our data, we need to say something about terminology. It's an incredibly complex, contested, difficult area. And there are a range of terms. And people feel quite awkward about using these terms. And sometimes they don't know what the terms mean. Um, so some of the terms are atheist, agnostic, humanist, secular, free thinker. Um, and again, research in Brazil, China, Denmark, Japan, the UK and USA concludes that atheists, that is people who don't believe in God and agnostics, people who don't know whether there is a God or not and don't believe there is a way to find out, exhibit significant diversity, both within countries and between different countries. So it's really, really difficult. When I use a term in Ireland, it's cannot or might not have the same meaning in Brazil or in Ethiopia or in Japan. And there are many negative terms, and by that I mean negative definitions. Definitions beginning with non-religious, non-believer, no religion, non-theist, unreligious, unbeliever, that many of the nuns find, even the word non um, is a deficit word. People find this difficult and they are not comfortable with this language. So we're searching for new terms. What we can say is that the terms that are used have variable meanings and that a word like atheism, even if we take it in terms of philosophy, it has multiple meanings. It's polysemious. So Atheist Ireland, if we're talking about atheism in Ireland, Atheist Ireland say atheists are just people who don't believe that any God exists. Most atheists believe things when there is reliable evidence that they are true. So Avin is going to take you now through the research. Thanks Avin. Thank you Trish. 
So just to begin with our data set, and as Trish said, we got about a 40% response rate from the two colleges, which we were pleased with. Um, the age group was a majority uh, between the age of 18 and 24 years old, and a small number then ranging from the ages of 35 up to 54 among our student cohort. Uh, the gender is interesting, mostly female, 86%, with a small percentage of males responding to the survey. It also reflects, I think, the smaller number of males uh, taking the PME and also in the teaching profession in Ireland, particularly at primary level. And this also correlates with data from the UK that supports this statistic saying that 15% of primary or nursery level teachers in the UK are male. So it's something I think we're very aware of in primary education, this gender divide. We got incredible symmetry and equilibrium here in, in the response rate. So 51% of PME2 and 49% of PME1, it worked out incredibly well. And also the urban rural divide was very, um, was very even as well. So it gave us a really good even spread across the different stratas there. This is a really interesting finding as well, which I think is very reflective of the centrality of Catholic education in Ireland. 97% of our participants went to a Catholic primary school and 89% of them went to a Catholic secondary school, which wouldn't be considered unusual in, in Ireland. Um, that's changing. There's more options and more multi-denominational schools coming on track now. But considering these are all adults, that wouldn't be a surprising um, statistic. So it, it just goes to show that Catholic schooling is an, or has been normative and maybe continues to be in the majority in Ireland. It's a really good visual, I think, for the overview of our Irish education system at the moment. This fascinated us. 100% of our participants all received sacraments, even though not all of them went to a Catholic primary school. 100%. It's very rare you'd see a statistic like that in any survey that you do in the affirmative. So. Um, again, it's very much pointing to our cultural experience of religion and our engagement with the sacraments. We asked them then, do they describe themselves as belonging to a particular religion uh, or a non-religious world, non worldview as well? 80% of them said they did, whether it was religious or unreligious, we, we didn't clarify at this stage. 20% uh, didn't know or didn't um, belong to um, anything. So we dug a little deeper then and gave them a range of beliefs to tick that, uh, that they identified with. And these are the ones that, they, that were ticked, I suppose. Um, the highest being Roman Catholic at 65%. We had 12% saying they were Christian. 32% of them didn't identify with a religious tradition. It was 1% were Church of Ireland, but the rest then were lapsed Catholic, free thinker, agnostic, atheist. Uh, this is quite consistent. I see Kate Stapleton is here. We, we were at a presentation last week where she looked at minority beliefs in secondary schools, and she had, I think, it was 39% of the students in secondary schools said that they didn't identify with the religious beliefs. So it's quite similar among our student cohort at PME level as well. We then asked how strongly they, they identify or, or feel attached to this belief, whether it's religious or non-religious. And interestingly, only 5% say that they're very strongly attached to their belief. 37% are weakly attached to their belief identity. And 63 are moderately to strongly attached. So again, that's saying something about the level of commitment and the, the role of religion and belief, I suppose, in their lives. We found this fascinating as well when we asked them if they attend religious services these days and these again is a cohort where 100% of them have made the first communion and their confirmation. 38% of them said only on specific holy days, 24% said never. 16% say they go once a week and again if you look at I suppose orthodox Catholicism would require a minimum of uh, once a week attendance at mass so 16% is quite low. Almost one in five never practice. So we feel this very much reflects the reality of cultural Catholicism where, that we're living with at the moment. And 
uh, the term I've heard more recently called FEC Catholics, F-E-C, funerals, Easter and Christmas, maybe the times that people might go to a religious service. It's important we feel as well to observe the difficulty that these respondents may have as teachers in religious faith-based schools where they might be required, particularly say in a Catholic school, to lead faith formation and to prepare children for the sacraments if the majority of them are not practicing themselves. I'll hand over to Trish now to look at the question when we asked them to tick a statement which was closest to their beliefs. Uh, one of the findings of this research, I suppose, is that orthodox uh, doctrine or teaching in uh, the Catholic tradition is not something perhaps that the majority of these students would gravitate towards. So belief in a personal God, in a God with whom you can have a personal relationship, that's kind of the linchpin of classical theism and classical Christianity. And yet, 34% do assent to say that this comes closest to their own belief, but 66%, you know, don't identify with that. So again, for us, this uh, lets us know that these students are going to have difficulty or perhaps belief dissonance when it comes to a school system in Ireland that uh, is, has the sacraments in the school and that has programs, 90% of the schools are Catholic, that are based on faith formation, where there is an assumption of a personal relationship with the divine. Um, can we move on? Avian, please. So the students, one in four of the students feel they can identify with a spirit or a life force. And we found that they're not really comfortable with conventional theological or religious language. They like something that is more nebulous, more open to interpretation, more generic. So spirit is definitely an attractive word or a life force. Can you move on? Please, Avi. So I believe that God is something within each person rather than something out there. So 16% of them identified with this. And they were talking about the fact, I suppose, imminence, uh, the capacity to experience uh, the divine within. That's very important. Uh, it's usually balanced in a tradition with a sense of transcendence, with a sense of going beyond the self. So these kinds of uh, practices in responding to the divine within might link in with mindfulness, meditation, practices like that. So again, it was interesting for us to see this. Can you move on? <clears throat> and we found that lots of our students, 16%, which is quite a high number, really don't know what to believe. And this is consistent with the work of Bullivant, his report, um, which shows that there is a lot less certainty about non-religious belief globally than people might assume. People might assume that unbelievers are incredibly dogmatic or incredibly attached to their views, but we found in our research consistent with Bullivant, that a lot of our participants really don't know what to believe. And that's interesting because I think in the past, definitely in Ireland, in terms of our educational system, up until Vatican II, 65, we had a catechism approach, we had a doctrinally laden approach, question and answer, rote learning, memorization, certainty, but we've moved away from that. Can you move on, please, Aveen? And we had 9% saying, I don't believe in any kind of God, spirit or life force. And again, with the census data, it's consistent with the census data 9.8. But as we said a few slides earlier, 33%, when we gave a range of choices, 33% or one in three identified with some non-religious, atheist, agnostic, um, humanist viewpoint. So here they say 9%. So we found that they, even within the research, uh, participants varied in their response. Can you move on, Avi? Okay, people in your life who self-identify as religious or non-religious. I mean, you'll see on the religious group on the left, you see their mothers, their fathers, their grandparents. There's a definite generational split here. 
So those in the generations above them tend to be the religious ones they identify with. The non-religious ones tend to be siblings, partners, and children wasn't relevant for 92% of them, but 5% had stated that their children were religious. So you see very much a divide here. Can you move on, Avi? Yeah. So I think we like, so why isn't this not moving? It just likes that. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we then asked them if you no longer, if you are no longer religious and you once were, can you give us an idea of the factors that influence your decision to not be religious anymore? And we got some interesting findings here. We gave them a few suggestions and they ticked whether it was important or not. So the first one we said was uh, you stop believing in God. And, and as you can say, see, 54% um, equate, I suppose, not believing in God with not being religious, which isn't a surprising finding, I suppose. 69% of the participants said that, who said that they were no longer religious said it was because um, they stopped believing in institutional religion. It's a very high percentage. Again, it's significant considering the role that institutional religion has in, our, in the majority of our schools in Ireland as well, and in the delivery of our religious programs. So what has happened in our institutional church uh, that is turning this educated cohort away? And this maybe helps us get at the answer 74% said that the sexual abuse of children by religious was a very important reason for falling away from religious belief. So for 91% of the PME cohort who are no longer religious, they, they attribute it to sexual abuse of children. Um, you know, and this very much is not something to underestimate. I think it's something we'd be quite aware of. Again, it wouldn't be a surprising finding and is echoed by what Michael Paul Gallagher talks about, that wounded credibility of the church in modern society today. Sorry, it's not moving for me. There we go. Uh, I no longer felt part of a community. We were wondering, would that have, have been a factor? Not so much. 64% felt, no, it wasn't really a reason for them not to, to um, identify with their religion anymore. 36 said it had some, 36% was of some importance. Sorry, it's a bit, it's not. There we go. Uh, a tragedy or a death that affected me and I began to question my faith. Not terribly, but 60% said not important. For some, maybe 40% it is important to some degree, but it's not a deal breaker for this age group. And then my parents stopped believing was definitely not um, a, a reason for them to leave religion either, because we saw in an earlier slide for them, their religious, their parents were generally quite religious, but it's not um, a reason for them to stay or leave their religion, it seems. One other participant added then in a comment box saying that um, he or she left the, her religious belief because of the church's stances on sexuality and the status of women. So we love this slide. Trish, do you want to begin speaking to this one? We asked them, we dug a bit deeper and said, well, what is it that you do believe? This area of the nuns, what, is, what are the beliefs? And these are the ones they ticked. We gave them a huge array of options. Uh, we, we were just interested in, you know, just look at energy. 50% of them believe in energy and 54% believe in souls. 8% in magic, um, psychics, 18%. Spirits, Avine, I don't know what that is. I think it's up to 50, 40, 42. 42. You're uh, over that. But it's definitely, if you were to do a course in classical Christian theology, there are as many things, chai in there, chakras, you know, that you would find reincarnation. You wouldn't find them in in that kind of a course definitely not in conventional catholic theology magic so we were just looking at the plurality of beliefs here mm -hmm. and many of them are supernatural beliefs and again i think one of the surprising findings is that we don't have a, a dichotomy between naturalism and supernaturalism that th those who are atheists only believe in nature and those who are religious believe in the supernatural we find that across the board there's this openness to a whole diversity of beliefs a whole range of beliefs yeah 
it's a whole we, eclectic mix we call this a mosaic yeah you know and we were talking about the supermarket of ideology peter berger who says that <clears throat> when people are, are thinking of religion or belief, they pick things that suit them, that suit their lives and their perspectives and their viewpoints. Perhaps in the past, it was something that was generationally handed down and you adhered to a tradition, whereas now there's a much greater emphasis on choice. So um, these were further comments on that question. 15% said none of those, I don't believe in any of those things you've listed. Others added spiritual healers, mediums, um, energy to an extent, like you do good things and good things may come, but that's not guaranteed though. Uh, I'm not certain what I do or I don't believe. There's that, that um, quote again. And then somebody else said, I'm not sure what extent I believe in any of these. I believe there is something more, but I don't know what that is. So we were chatting about it myself and Trisha, there's almost a reverential agnosticism there that there's, there's a real un, uh, lack of certainty about what to believe. And, and that you do good things and good things may come. That kind of karmic principle, you know, again, we're finding all kinds of interesting resonances here. Mm -hmm. If you are non-religious, is there anything that would attract you to join a religious tradition, we asked them. And 69% of them said, absolutely no, no. And then um, some of them said, I would like if the religious tradition was welcoming to all types of people. And again, we're thinking of um, attitudes. Ireland has changed so dramatically in terms of um, same-sex marriages, the recent referenda that we've had on abortion, um, attitudes towards gender. So there's a feeling that, um, you know, th there's a need to catch up, that religious traditions are out of sync, that they are disconnected from society. Um, if it provided meaning, one said, another said other people's experiences might attract them to join a religious tradition. And one said, I've seen myself that my grandparents get a sense of community, routine and comfort from practicing a religion and going to mass. Maybe when I'm older, I may seek the same. I suppose I don't know what life has ahead of me. So there's the notion of the prodigals, of that you go away at a certain stage in your life and you come back at a later stage in your life. Can you move on? Mm -hmm. So if you are religious, is there anything that would attract you to join a non-religious worldview? So the dishonesty of the Catholic Church is you know, the greatest attraction for one to join a non-religious view. Another said, um, rituals. I find the rituals surrounding marriage, death, comforting. Now it's interesting that in the past year, non-religious services have um, outpaced religious services when it comes to weddings in Ireland. And there are far more people having naming ceremonies, um, funerals that are humanist or non-religious in Ireland. Um, another says, I think my religion, Catholicism, needs to adapt to suit the current climate if it is to last, as currently it doesn't resonate with the young people of Ireland. Okay. I'm trying to move here. It's just got very slow. Why is Don't it responding? Worry. Come on. I'll try this. I think it's interesting that 69% said in the last slide, no, and 68 there, yeah, no, quite, I wouldn't be tempted. Quite consistent, yeah. So then we asked um, the more questions about their professional practice, I suppose. And this, this gave us great hope and it was a real success story, I think, for our future educators. 98% of them said that they would be extremely, somewhat to extremely curious to learn more about different religious traditions and non-religious worldviews and 96% were somewhat too extremely comfortable to visit places of worship different to their own. So we think there's um, a good display there of dispositions of openness and curiosity and respect, which is what we would hope for in, in our educators. Trish, do you wanna take this one? Yeah, now it moves. 72% um, feel comfortable as future educators teaching about different religions. So we move down 
percentage wise in terms of teaching. And again, we move down a gear, 66% feel comfortable teaching about non-religious beliefs. 15% do not feel comfortable and 19% don't know. That's a big percentage. It's almost one in four don't know if they would feel comfortable teaching about non-religious beliefs. So definitely, when it comes to teaching about different world religions, different religious perspectives, they feel more comfortable. They feel a lot less comfortable and less certain uh, when it comes to non-religious beliefs. Yeah. Then regarding parents, we asked, would you feel confident uh, communicating with parents about their beliefs and the needs of their children? Only 49% of them would feel confident dealing with parents and talking to parents about their needs or their wishes. And we found this quite an interesting finding. Um, we probed it, we've been doing some interviews since and we've probed a bit with our, with our interviewees why that is. And the feedback we're getting is we might know how to handle if the, if the parents are very strong or very right wing and whatever their belief is, um, how would we handle difficult conversations or if they had values that we didn't agree with, how do we actually negotiate that territory? So. Um, there is a there's evidence of a vulnerability there in in these students or soon to be teachers in how to deal with parents around their beliefs. They're they're also afraid of being foolish, of saying the wrong thing, of being ignorant, of causing offence. So they're quite sensitive. This came out in the in depth interviews. So there was a as Avine says a vulnerability. And they're not used to people talking about uh, non-religious belief. It tends to be something that's not spoken about, that they're not really aware of. Yeah, I'm trying to move it here now. Don't worry. We're near the end, guys. We're near the end. Maybe we're there we go. Here we go. Um, so 40, oh sorry Trish, you, you speak to this one. I just yeah, 40% of them were aware of resources that they could draw on for primary school on the teaching of non-religious beliefs. Now sadly 60% are not aware and we didn't ask everybody, we put a comments box after it and some of the respondents volunteered uh, themselves educate together modules on humanism and goodness me goodness you their website so we were delighted to see that that they were thinking of resources but 60 percent are not aware of any resources and one student in the focus group said when it comes to unbelief i wouldn't even know where to begin i don't know what that is and i wouldn't know where to begin teaching it i thought that was a kind of salutary remark okay then we asked them about um, their initial teacher education. Did they feel they had adequate input? 71 agreed that they had adequate input on teaching methodologies to teach different religions. 25% uh, didn't, uh, four didn't know. And 49% uh, agreed that they were given adequate teaching on methodologies to teach about non-religious beliefs. So that's quite a, quite a difference. Um, and again, 37 didn't agree. So that's telling us, I suppose, as initial teacher educators, what we need to start becoming more aware of as regards how we teach about the non-religious in our modules as well. Trish? Is it appropriate to teach children about a range of non-religious beliefs? 95% of them said yes and 5% said no. So given that 95% of them feel that it's appropriate and 60% of them really don't feel, know any resources or how they might go about it. We thought that was interesting. Um, and when we dug down deeper, some of them felt you should start with little kids, first day in school, you know, from four to five onwards and junior infants. Some more felt it was the senior classes, kids around nine, 10, 11, 12. Five were unsure what age would be appropriate and some felt that it was the ethos of the school so that you would follow the, the guidance of the school. And in the in-depth interviews that really came across, the principle was pivotal in whether or not they would teach about non-religious views. Thanks, Avi. Trying to move it. <laughs> I think my okay. mouse is going in out of connection here. Come on. Sorry, there we go. Um, 
Did I skip a slide there? No. I think I did. There we go. Yeah. So when we when we when we asked them then about that, um, they said, "I'm not sure when is the right time to teach." I think it's it seems like a touchy subject, and I can see myself and other teachers steering away from the topic of non-belief so as not to offend families. Um, another another students that I, I it should be normalized part of the RE curriculum from first or second class. Uh, another comment was I'm unsure of the impact the ethos of the school would have, but if a non-religious child was in your class, it would be important to cater for their needs and support learners to understand each other. And finally, another comment: children are taught about religious beliefs from the time they're born, so it is just as appropriate to provide them with information about non-religious beliefs from the same time, from birth. We then asked them, do you feel knowledgeable about the beliefs of families coming from non-religious traditions? And 67% of them said no. To be honest, I don't even know what the term non-religious traditions means. I'm not familiar with it at all. And then another comment here, I may not know everything about every non-religious belief, but I am confident in my ability to listen and to, those, to those students and engage in my own research. Communication, understanding, empathy, open discussions are more important than knowledge for education in this area, which I thought was a wonderful response from a BME student. Other comments were, I would not feel knowledgeable about non-religious traditions. I wouldn't know how to approach something like this. And somebody else then said, I would if it was in an Educate Together school or a community national school. I've always found there's little guidance for children in Catholic schools who do not participate in religion. I'm aware that not everyone from a non-religious tradition will have the same experience and it'll mean something different to two people who both come from the same non-religious tradition. Really interesting comment. Trish? We're just near the end. So, you know, just read these comments here. Do you feel confident teaching Ori to children from a non-religious background? I wouldn't know how to do it, how to teach uh, RE to children from non-religious traditions and just um, read that final comment. Oops, sorry, that's okay. the last comment that's, there. That's yeah. fine. These are just some comments that uh, we want to leave you with. Um, like there's a variety of approaches and experience. Um, they're afraid, some of them, of upsetting parents. Um, as someone who is not religious themselves, I wouldn't feel confident or comfortable imparting the RE curriculum on a child who comes from a non-religious background. So it's a complex area. It's an area we don't know an awful lot about. We're just at the beginning of our research. If you can move on, Avi, we hope to move on to the parents of primary school children next. We hope to move on to primary school teachers. We would love in the future to work with the children themselves and hear their voices in this area. But most importantly, we're interested in hearing your voices now. So if you have any comments or questions or observations that could help us in our work, we would be so delighted. So over to you. Has anybody got any comments or just, questions? Just unmute your mic if you'd like to speak. Super. Can we minimize the screen? Or, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that. Oh, it's so lovely to see everyone. <laughs> you can click gallery view actually if you want to see. Yeah. Everybody in the room. Yeah, that's so nice. Very nice. Okay. You can write a comment in the chat or you can just unmute yourself and ask. Are her. you, are you still on. out there breathing? <laughs> <laughs> Did we speak you into a stupor? Thanks, Patricia, Avine. I Fascinating. Um, yeah, wonderful research. And I think it is, I think it's really important to, to hear the voice of students and how they're trying to, I, I think I feel sorry for them, how they're trying to navigate between the multiple spaces that they're in um, while they're confused themselves, which is, yeah, yeah, and it's fa fascinating. Thank, thank you. Um, 
That's good. I think it's fascinating. It's fascinating research. I think the generation divide is really interesting, even looking at the statistics from Bullivant, because those people in the 15 to 29 age group in 10 years, they're the parents of all the children in our schools. So what you're doing now is so relevant because it's going to come even more important in the next decade. So thank you. Really interesting and look forward to hearing more as time goes by. Yeah, can I, can I just say, Jackie wrote the programme for the Church of Ireland schools in Ireland, the Follow Me programme. And from 2001, is it Jackie, you had within that programme catered for non-religious and religious beliefs. Is that true, Jackie? Maybe you could, am, am I putting you on the spot? It, it's true that it's in the aims of sensitivity towards those of other faiths and non but I sit here feeling very guilty that it's not as explicit as it should be. And I'm writing down notes here, thinking about how even with the students I'm working with, how to make it more clear to them so they are very sure of how to fulfill that aim. So it's there, but I wish it was stronger. Thank you. Yeah. Did Paul Trish? want to come in there? I saw Sorry. Paul waving his hand there, Paul Gifford. Go ahead, Paul, if you want to unmute. No, I it's fascinating research, but I, I noticed um, Trish mentioned Berger. Yeah. Did you, did you relate your research to the whole secularization theory or, or not at all? Uh, the short answer, Paul, is not at all, because we're, this is our maiden voyage. The research, we, we carried out the last um, in-depth interview yesterday afternoon. So we're, this is very recent research, but can I have your thoughts on that? What, you know, because you are an expert in this area, so you have written on this area too. What, what would you suggest? How might you see links? Says she picking up a biro. Well, I don't, I don't really know, uh, but given the fact that um, so many people just uh, discredit the, the secularization thesis. Uh, I, I, I would. It would seem to me that basically you are agreeing with it. That you're yeah. watching Irish society secularize before your eyes. And I, no, I've really put on the spot like this. I don't really know what to say. But I, I was interested to see whether you had come from that background and were illustrating or, or disproving aspects of the secularization thesis, but, but you weren't really at all. You're doing something entirely different, something totally new and, and more, more part of your elbow. I think we're, I don't know, Avine, what you would say, but I think we're just seeing what emerges at this stage. We're just, and the data is very raw, um, what's of interest yeah. to me is that um, the kind of the non-religious cohort um, are comfortable with belief in the supernatural. I don't think it's as clear cut as a secularized society that is, you know, jilting religion. Um, but I don't know, Avine, what about you? Yeah, I think we're working out of a hunch and an, um, an experience with our students where we're very aware of their, how they're grappling with their own belief. And um, it's, it's all very anecdotal talking to our students. So we were curious to see what the findings would be. And we want to go further, obviously, into the schools, the parents, the, the, the teachers as well, and just see what do people really think. And we were, were quite taken by that idea of the nuns, the nuns, um, as a term as well and and to unpack what that actually means it doesn't necessarily believe mean they're not they don't have beliefs or religious beliefs uh, they're not neatly categorized as atheists or agnostics we want to really try and unpack what a nun is as well mm -hmm. I, on one point i it, i did note that you used the term supernatural in saying that right across the board people believe in the supernatural mm -hmm. and i think there's value in really clarifying what you mean by that mm -hmm. Like somebody believes in the soul, it's just my essential isness. I myself think you get confused when you start to call that supernatural. It's just, okay. it, it's so interior, it's so intrinsic to me, my essential isness. Um, whereas so many of the New Age people, or this comes into the secularization thesis, um, would see that as a new form of religion. Um, 
whereas many others would say, no, it's not. It's just personalizing. It's this um, um, uh, in, individual individualism, and it's finding your your own true self. I mean, I'm all in favor of it, but I think there's value to be had in trying to distinguish that from yeah. any religious point of view. But yeah. So much of it, I suppose, does depend on how you define things. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's very true. How we frame that. In, in our future um, in-depth interviews, I think we had said when we looked across the range of beliefs that we were going to dig down deeper and ask people, what do they mean by soul, spirit, you know, all the things that they were ticking in the box that they, that they believed in. Um, so I think, you know, that indicates that we will, that's a, a way to go for our research. Yeah, we're fascinated as well by the fluidity of beliefs that people are saying, you know, I'm balancing my chakras while praying the Hail Mary. And, you know, this, that, that people are able to just um, embrace it all. And it, uh, it might be second, I think you were talking, is it a new religion or is it the new search um, for this larger kind of a understanding of God or supernatural? It's, it's fascinating. It's, I think we should dig, delve more into those beliefs. Yeah. Hi, Eileen and Trish, Morris here. Hi, Morris. Um, most enjoyable. And again, coming back to that thing that we know from our experience with the students, that there is great confusion out there for them. And as Jackie said, these will be the parents of the children that will be sitting in front of teachers in the future, and they are the parents of the future. But it's not just the future. It's the children themselves today are living in this blended faith mm -hmm. situation, and it is impacting on how they interact with the world. So it would be interesting to see digging deeper into that parental influence um, in relation to what type of belief systems are they living within in their own families. Um, in my own research, I found that children who were living in uh, multiple faith experience and belief system families found that the children, you know, one of the children described themselves as a Catholic Buddhist um, in my own work. So I suppose being aware that it is the, soci the sociological and uh, societal impact that that's having on people when it comes to religion today, that it isn't as narrow as they were living in traditional one religion families yeah. or belief system families. Yeah. But I think it's very interesting, uh, this whole concept of the nuns. Um, I was in looking at another piece of research there recently, and it was interesting to see the amount of people who describe themselves as nuns who actually teach religious education in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, and that they, even some people describing themselves as atheists and still teaching religious education programs. So I think there's a whole conversation around what is religious education going forward too um, for a lot of the students who are there. Just mm -hmm. one last thing anecdote uh, from my own work. Uh, I, there was a whole section on embracing the other in the classroom with children. My own research was with children in religion and the children felt the reason they didn't learn, weren't being taught more about other religions they felt was because some parents had come and give out to the teacher and they couldn't be hacking with that if we're teachers. So it's interesting point of view that they saw that it was something that um, it was just not there and they didn't want to create hassle because some parents wouldn't like it. So it wasn't about the teachers for the children. It was about parental influence. So children are very interesting and insightful when it comes to these things. Mm. Thanks, Morris. Thanks, Morris. Trish, Hi. Trish, do you, do you mind if I ask a, I'm sorry. No, yeah, go on, yeah. on. We've Claire yeah, and we've Anne. Yeah, okay, go ahead, Anne. I'm, I'm sorry, Anne excuse me, um, It's been a long time since I taught in Ireland. But when I taught in Ireland um, in the 80s, uh, it was very clear that um, school principals had little to no moral um, position apart from what the local parish priests say. And so the principal would go through the profession of being a teacher and move up through the ranks, but then hit this wall of um, priests once they took over a school. Is, is that still the case in Ireland and is there an impact of local parish priests on controlling what um, schools and school principals feel comfortable doing? Uh, 
That's a complex question. Things have changed since the 1980s. Uh, I think um, schools are managed, 90% of schools are managed by, uh, in terms of Catholic schools, by the Catholic Church. Uh, and you would have a board of management. Traditionally, perhaps in the 80s, the priest or the parish priest would be the chair of the board of management. Perhaps that would be normal. Um, at this stage, uh, it's more likely that a lay person would be there, that there would be representation from the community. Um, so there is a, a far more dialogical uh, relationship um, you know, that's far more transparent. It wouldn't be, you describe it as a wall, you know, and the schools would attempt to be inclusive and supportive welcoming. Yeah. and welcoming. So there's a, a very decisive change of emphasis yeah. um, in, in those schools. I think, could, yeah. yeah. Uh, Tr Trish, could, could you look at the, at the profiles of those um, committees and determine how conservative they are or would that be of any value i know you're talking to to the to the teachers and everything but unless you also include the the boards of the, management the managers or yeah. the patrons of the school the bishops right. in catholics they're the patrons of the school um i think it's for it it's mm. definitely a stage of research of further research what do you think avi yeah yeah i think there would be value in that for sure uh, our research told us that just definitely from the in-depth interviews that the students were very cautious when it came to principals. Principals appeared to be really authoritative for them. And I know they're beginning teachers, but many of them felt that, the, that their own principals were trumped by the principal, P-A-L, of the school and that they wanted to teach about non-religious beliefs in the school. But if the principal of the school didn't think that was a good idea, they would jettison it, you mm -hmm. know, so that was coming forward. So rather than it being boards of managements or parish priests, in the little bit of beginning research we've done, principals come forward as being powerful gatekeepers of what's taught in a school. Mm. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Uh, Claire, Claire Woods. She's one of our Hi, master's students, um, Marino. Hi, Claire. Hi, Claire. Hi, Hi, Patricia. That was very interesting. Thanks very much. Um, I'm actually doing a bit of small scale research myself in a Catholic secondary school in Ireland. And I found similar, about a quarter of the students that responded um, to my uh, questionnaire are atheist or have no belief. They're not um, affiliated with any belief system. But just in general, 35% of them have no interest in religion in general. Um, yeah. They're not really, because the ORI program is meant to be non denominate well it's got it's catholic ethos school but it's meant to be open to everyone like everyone can partake it's not meant to be closed off to anyone but 35 percent of them are saying that they're not really interested in it even from a historical or a sociological perspective it's not really um in of interest to them and i was just thinking is are there any kind of ways of re-engaging them or has anything kind of sprung to mind in terms of how to get them back at the conversation the uh about a third of them that have no real interest in religion in general Mm. It's a good question, Claire, and I wonder if, they're, if, they, um, if their voice is heard in a dialogical classroom in the school. I know it's probably the NCCA syllabus you're using that's open for all beliefs and, and none. So do they join the conversation or do they just disengage, I wonder, because their voice is important. That's what we're trying to get at. Do they have a voice? Uh, are their beliefs taken seriously? Um, I've seen a bit of your data, actually. Um, and you know they they felt that they're kind of there's a disappointed uh, response from their teachers if they say that they're atheist or agnostic they sense that that it's oh you know there's um it it'll be respected but there's a huge disappointment from their teachers so yeah i think we have to look at how we respond to the to the to the nuns as well Mm, yeah definitely very interesting and even some of them were saying I was saying like look are your beliefs celebrated recognised in the school do you feel included and they're like well there aren't any atheist beliefs and we have no traditions you know they were kind of there was a lack of community there because there aren't really that they were familiar with any kind of atheist organisations mm -hmm. that they could practice with or that there was kind yeah. of a bit of a gap there yeah yeah that's a good point too yeah. I, 
I think I think there's a feeling of disloyalty sometimes too. I mean, some of our participants, there was this feeling that in a faith school, if you start teaching about non-religious traditions, it's disloyal to the ethos of the school in some way. And it might be compromising for your career or, you know, it might be the best thing to do politically uh, within the school. So it's, it's a very sensitive area, but it, clearly needs to be done. We need education across the board about non-religious beliefs because this is increasing so rapidly. Our next census in Ireland is 2021. And if it's anything like the expansion that we've had between 2011 and 2016, we probably will have a hundred, you know, a hundred, uh, 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 of a great, much greater increase than we have had. We could be going up to 15% or 20% non-religious, you know, so we are just waiting to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Vanula, Vanula, did you have a question yet? Yeah, no, I, just, I was just going to say, like, it's fantastic to see this research because, you know, it's a long time needed. And um, it's and the questions were really good, guys, the questions, you know, what exactly do you believe in and all that, like, it's fantastic to see in Trinidad, like, some of those slides, you go, well, I believe in ghosts, and they believe in all kinds of things, you know, it's, it's fantastic. I think, you know, what you always get a bit depressed about is, you know, the teachers, when they say, they basically, they don't have the confidence, they don't have the confidence cheat talking to parents or any of that, you know, and it's very hard to try and you know, move them towards the fact that it's not about them. And we all make mistakes and making mistakes is part of the journey. And it's how you deal with the mistakes afterwards is the issue. And, you know, and generally speaking, they are huge mistakes anyway. Like, you know, if you're professional, you just, you know, it should be fine. But it's just, I, do, I just find to try and nudge them towards the process is not about them. It's about the children in front of them. And that if they can somehow shift the focus, so it's more child, centered than teacher centered but um, i appreciate that this research is all about their own um philo uh, philosophies and beliefs yeah and fanula is the author of some of the materials in ireland called signposts lessons for living which has uh, lessons on naming ceremonies and non-religious ceremonies and you've also been involved have you in the lessons on humanism as well um that with the uh, Humanist Association of Ireland. So even though there aren't a humongous number of resources, Atheist Ireland also have them, um, whatever resources are there, Fanula has been involved in working on those. So well done. Thanks a million for uh, joining in with us. <laughs> I know, but I mean, it, it's, it's an area that there's very, yeah, there's very little resources out there. And like, I do appreciate that people, it's a very new, it's, it's, of course, it's not a new area, but there's, it's a new light that's been shone on it. And so, um, you know, people are, yeah, people are unsure of themselves. And anyway, this is very welcome research. It's fantastic if we can start developing new modules, new, res um, new resources to address these issues. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. And giving them a clearer voice, you know, and, and looking at our language around the nons, nuns. It's a real struggle, isn't it? It is, yeah, because I always say, like, uh, you know, you would never call a Buddhist a non Hindu. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and yet we would call, yeah, somebody non religious. Yeah. I, it's just two o'clock. So four, if four o'clock or four o'clock, four o'clock, sorry, four o'clock. I'm on my own time zone here. Um, if anybody doesn't have another question, does anybody have another question? No. Um, I'm just conscious we've kept you for one hour on Zoom and it's been wonderful to be joined in by all of you. And uh, we're sending you all the very best. Thanks a million for tuning us in today. And uh, if you have any advice, suggestions, further areas that you think we should look at, um, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. And it's great to see you all. And uh, we're sending you every good wish. Okay, so Absolutely. we'll thanks, everyone. log off. Thank you all so much. And Take thanks care. to Carly too. Okay, and thanks to Aveen. Bye. Thanks, Trish. Bye. I'll just... Stuff. Avine, can I stay on with you yeah. for a second? Mm -hmm.